This is the Energizing India podcast. Welcome to the Energizing India podcast. Today we speak to Shitan Shutyagi, co-founder and orchestrator at Emo Energy. Uh, his firm has developed Zen, a battery tech platform for net zero solutions, boasting 100% fire safety, something we'd like to talk about today, a swift 20 minute charge, again, a problem that's not been addressed by many people around the world, and a 120% extended battery life. Um, sounds like a dream to invest in. He has a decade of expertise in the mobility sector, including roles with major OEMs like Aether, Ola, Rivian, and Alta. Shitanshu is dedicated to creating sustainable transport systems for cleaner cities. Shitanshu, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you for having me. Um, Shitanshu, you have been in one of the most magical companies in the EV space. You worked with Rivian um, in California. Um, I am really interested to know how that experience was for you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I actually ended up joining Rivian early on when it was like a small workshop out of Michigan and it's around 50 people strong. And to actually see it go from 50 to 500 to 1000 people in let's say less than two and a half years was quite, yeah, it was quite breathtaking. I, no one ever imagined Rivian could get as big as it is, but it's really a combination of just the few people that really started there, the CEO at the helm, the decisions they took over time and just how they were able to really execute product, technology, design, and just overall market approach. And yeah, this just sheer focus on listening to the customer and making a product and making an entire package of what they wanted to deliver. Yeah, it's really the reason Rivian is what it is today. And yeah, it was there quite early on when they were doing the design for the first R1T and seeing it from sketch to actual production. Yeah, it's pretty magical experience. Yeah. So you went from Rivian to Acer. So you've done two quite amazing startups, right? So Aether is yeah. almost that equivalent in India where no, they had this magical journey and they're led by some amazing people. They've built an amazing product. And, you know, it's a two-wheeler because that's the market in India. And yet they pitched the same way Rivian did. What do you, you know, for the entrepreneurs who listen to the show, what do you think are the key differences between an American startup like Rivian and an Indian startup like Aether? I think Aether in its own sense is also very magical, right? Like for them to have existed for them to still exist and for them to continue existing is huge. Uh, for an Indian company to start from two college graduates sitting somewhere and then building out what they have is incredible. So Aether has gone through their whole ups and downs also, right? To get where they are, it's not been easy for anybody. But again, it's down to the two or three people in that company, the sheer audacity to say that, okay, no, everybody's making this wrong. Everybody will continue to make this wrong. And we understand what is required. That then shows as passion, then shows as multiple things around product ecosystem. It shows as decisions made, right, over time. And for me, at least, it's very unique in its own right that you can get to do that in India, right? Like most people imagine that this is impossible here. You have to go to the US or you have to go to some German country for that matter, German city for that matter to be able to do this. So the fact that they've been able to do ground up R&D from scratch without relying on any experts, without anything, is yeah it's quite remarkable and the people who i would say clearly responsible for at least maybe the first version of aether what the architecture is were just 25 30 year olds just sitting in a room right it, it wasn't uh, like some 100 years old with experience they didn't have any of that they just had the passion and the intent to just get it done and i think that matters more than anything else and yeah for me uh, in terms of work culture there's a lot of similarities both of them always kind of push you to just push components to failure, really be able to see what the limit is, be sure of knowing what the limit is and actually testing it in all fronts, right? Not just engineering, design, everything. And that shows like their stores, their product, their body, not body language, the company's language, everything. It's very clear. And uh, yeah, I'd say there's uh, obvious differences in just how companies function because of the geographical areas involved. But I think both companies are very clear that product comes first people obviously are very critical to achieving that and listening to the customer and really going down to genuinely listen to what they want is very critical and not just assuming you know what you want so yeah that's been very clear for both companies and that's why it shows yeah i'd agree with you i think having visited Acer, it does feel like a global startup they've got yeah, lots of mad scientists working on very unique problems also it's very interesting to note that a number of in incredibly 
successful entrepreneurs have come out of Aether. You are one of them. Uh, Arun from Exponent, another. So it obviously has a cl- culture that fosters entrepreneurship within its own team as well. No, and I mean he's very critical to what Aether is too, right? Like he was there for the longest time, and yeah, there's few people who define that, and yeah, he's one of them. There's, uh, yeah, I think you can pick on maybe two hands, like the first few people who, uh, some of them are still there, and yeah, it's, it's quite amazing. So, yeah. so she thanks you. Let's talk about your. Um, the technology you're bringing or the problem you're solving. You know, in the introduction, I'd said, you're creating a battery that's 100% fire safe, that gives you a 20 minute swift charge and a 120% extension in battery life. Um, So let's, uh, that's the statement that you're doing. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Why did you arrive at this? Right, no, absolutely. So uh, this actually all started when Rahul and I were at Ola. We were obviously seeing how the market is evolving, what people wanted. And we felt like there was a solution in the two-wheeler space, at least on the higher end, like you have one lakh products, you have everything to one and a half lakh. So there has been a lot of solutions there. But when we used to talk to a lot of the gig workers, let's say the fleet guys were actually going electric, where the focus to, let's say, get the 8 million riders electric is today. All the companies involved really want that to happen. We felt like there was a giant disparity in terms of what solutions were being implemented, what the requirements were, and in terms of what I guess the riders wanted from a price point, performance, and just overall kind of solution perspective. So yeah, understood a lot from what people are implementing in Percival. Swapping, how double batteries are being used, they're riding almost 150 kilometers a day. There's a lot of uh, lack of trust and confidence in the overall system because batteries are poorly built. And we started trying to understand these problems from scratch. So in the beginning, uh, Rahul and I imagined this that, okay, that we try to build some kind of a software platform to essentially improve safety, improve performance, life, somehow magically improve all these factors just by software. So riders feel more confident, the price points make sense, the monthly rentals make sense, the one rupee per kilometer number people keep talking about actually gets uh, delivered. So that was a problem statement. How do you get more and more riders to go electric? We heard a lot of complaints from their current systems. We heard a lot of complaints around cost and just overall efficiency, reliability, everything, right? And we realized that if there was going to be a solution from just a software perspective, it really wasn't there. Because if you take the fundamental way two-wheeler battery packs are being built, and let's exclude maybe Aether and Ola for a bit, and let's take the long tail of this market and just battery assemblers in general. There's a very specific way they've been building systems. And a lot of it is derived from some of the kind of Chinese battery packs are built and some of the parts we've imported, some of the processes we've imported. So we felt like the problem wasn't just in the fact that there was some software, the hardware itself is fundamentally weak. Like we're using very high power, high, very high energy NCS cells and MC cells and very poorly packing them in a basic system. Uh, BMSs are questionable and that whole problem became a lot more apparent to us. And having come from this background for me and Rahul, uh, having he having spent 10 years more than me doing this at General Motors and then at Sun Mobility specifically before Ola, we felt like if there was a ground up solution to design the hardware for the battery pack, get one product right using the most basic cells. So you take the most standard cells in the market, how do we get that to where you have safety so you can offer the confidence the customer wants, you have the right level of performance so you can get the kilometers in the range they require daily. And then you also have the cost right where the TCO makes sense, the life is right. So this was the problem statement when we started. We then went uh, back to the drawing board and actually then figured out an entire battery pack architecture, which we now essentially call ZenPack, which then for us then is actually able to meet these claims that we're talking about. So safety, uh, actually being able to fast charge uh, to a certain specific value, and then also be able to get, let's say 2000 cycles using the most standard basic cells, which normally would only give you 1000, 1200 cycles. That became the solution to this problem. So are you using a lithium chemistry or moving away from lithium? So today we use uh, lithium chemistries. We've been using NCA chemistries for our two-wheeler packs. We use LFP for our larger battery packs. But we are obviously testing sodium. We are testing alternate chemistries as we go because uh, I feel like there are a lot of issues around the supply chain, geopolitical issues, which we don't control today, which can affect our business in the long term, right? So it's very critical for us as a company to figure out a long-term uh, transition, at least to a certain extent, to a sodium chemistry. That comes at its costs. Uh, there is obviously an energy disadvantage. There is a life cycle disadvantage, at least in today's uh, standards. But it's catching up quickly. Uh, we're working with multiple companies all the way from the basic chemistry blocks till production. But today we are also just starting to build packs with sodium cells. So before we dive a little bit more into sodium, let's talk about lithium. How do you guarantee 100% fire safety with lithium? Because nobody, I've never heard anybody make that uh, that statement right. before. Uh, so I'd say there's really three things to be able to kind of get at least fire safety at a pack level, right? For us, 
there's monitoring on a cell level. So we literally monitor temperature, voltage, and resistance for every single cell in our pack. So there's 112 cells which give up two kilowatt hour. We monitor voltage, temperature, current for every one of those. For us then to be able to know that there is a temperature rise or the resistance change in a specific cell becomes very uh, critical. So cutting off a pack if there's an issue happening, knowing that okay you have temperature sensors across the pack and not just in spots where then you can't really regulate is very critical. So monitoring for us becomes very important. We today on road have never had an issue, but even in tests, we're essentially able to just cut off the pack and basically avoid any kind of current increase or kind of overcharge scenario. So your BMS is actually doing a real job in yeah, terms of managing the thermal uh, exchanges that are going on. Right, and I think there's a lot of smart BMSs, and that's one thing. But for you to be able to actually monitor not just strings of cells, but actually monitor every cell is very critical. So that's something we've been able to do, but. Even in terms of a thermal propagation, if one cell, let's say, has a quality defect of some sort, and there's some unavoidable scenario is going to catch fire, right? Like it's going to blast open the center, from the top, or however it is. The next stage to this is mitigation. Right? How do you make sure that if a cell goes into runaway, you actually be able to protect at least the vehicle? There's no explosion, no fire, and maybe you have a 10-15 second mild amount of smoke. You can just get away out and release that pressure. So we have a patented fluid we use now in the pack, which essentially circulates all within the kind of the entire battery. It's fully submerged, and that, along with the control system, then offers a safety level. Then we can actually guarantee, let's say, a safety level that we talk about, right? So one cell blasts open, the surrounding material is able to absorb that energy. We have automatic kind of electronic vents which activate, and then all of this pressure is released quickly with fans inside the battery pack. So they push. uh kind of pressure out and then release it through the vent so that active automated kind of loop that we've been able to form using the fluid the fans the sensors and then the vents then essentially as allows the mitigation that we need and this is something i'd say two and three wheeler packs don't do at all there are maybe larger packs in the kind of us or maybe even china that are doing similar systems but it becomes a lot more expensive to do the way they do it so they use thermal potting compounds they'll use let's say cooling plates so that it becomes a lot more expensive to do for us to be able to get the safety levels we're getting at the overall product kind of performance that we're getting is something we haven't really been able to see so the second part of your value proposition is a swift 20 minute charge right. and tell me how you achieve that and why even rivian uh, has not been able to so i think a lot of companies and uh, are starting to get to 80 50% kind of charge in that period right and we today specifically aren't doing let's say a full charge very much we're very, being very specific about that we say there's a specific amount of kilowatt hours we give you so 3.3 kilowatt chargers for a 1.8 usable kilowatt hour is what we're doing today so in 20 minutes we're essentially guaranteeing a full 50% charge so for us on road what that allows us to do is riders who are actually doing let's say 150 kilometers a day that's the maximum we are seeing for the gig workers they can essentially plug into our system maybe 3 times a day for a cumulative of 60 minutes and charge the exact amount that they are essentially doing so it's 80 kilometers per charge uh, that's around 40 minutes to full charge and for us that's been a very key understanding that not increasing power output making it easier to set up these chargers the density of those chargers the exact unit economics and how this will work with the rider with our charger with our battery is something we've been very specific about uh, we aren't even trying much faster than that we're being very clear that we'll do 3.3 kilowatt charging for a 1.8 kilowatt hour battery because in the use case we're going after all these gig riders nobody really needs more than that and for us also now big realization is that this value proposition becomes so specific to this segment that anything else like a double battery or a swapping or a slow charge is always going to be more ineffective compared to this even if i try to charge faster than this the power i'd need the everything i need in this kind of a urban environment would be just a lot harder and a lot more expensive in the long run so specifically decentralized 3 kilowatt charging for 1.5 to 2 kilowatt hour batteries we particularly feel is the future in this segment in the two wheeler segment and that's why we're kind of tapping both ends of the problem we're working with cpos to set up chargers we're also selling batteries we're selling the software that connects the two and then actually integrates with the rider and that then becomes the entire solution for a fleet operator or a rider themselves where they just yeah can work specifically with us with any vehicle that they have so are you agnostic to swap versus charge or is it very specifically fast charge it's actually really not for us it's a a swappable battery it is a removable battery uh, you can swap it out and put another one if you really want to get like out of the way just within a minute uh, it's something we're not against it's something i feel where 
there are niche applications for swapping but just the scale and the economics to really allow it to get to a million units is hard right and i think there is a lot of people trying to do it and it's great we're working with them for that matter but even within their swapping infrastructure we're pushing them to charge faster so batteries are might take 4 5 hours to charge now charge within an hour for them so utilization rate even for swapping stations is improved from let's say 1 is to uh, like 140 batteries for 100 Uh, vehicles to just 20 extra batteries in the uh, system so yeah we do realize the need for instant refueling so swapping is uh, a vehicle option but i think on ground the actual usage would be lower than we anticipate for fast charge so are you um, a battery company or a smart bms company or a charger manufacturer or everything no so for us it's a very we we offer a tech solution here we are the solution enabler for this gig economy space right whatever it takes us to get there it's imp- it's important to do it today we're a battery company that ties up with charge point operators to then implement a solution for riders and we manufacture our batteries uh, we implement our own software we have our own charger which we implement other people so that whole solution then allows us to be the middle layer where we then work with the vehicle oem we work with the rider and that's pretty much it it uh, there's I'd say maybe 20 vehicles in the market all of them can use the same battery pack today it fits in everything the voltage is match everything we've spent a lot of time getting that right so it's very critical for us to be just the tech layer between the vehicle and the rider essentially so Shantanshu you're looking at the two wheeler gig uh, you know vehicle and then you've got for example Exponent that's looking at the three wheeler maybe the four wheeler light right. you know 1 ton sub 1 ton or 1 and a half ton last mile delivery right. and then you've also got Log9 in the same sort of space Is that the sort of differentiation between the three of you, or how do you see Emo being different in this space? Right, I say there is a, obviously differences in application. I don't feel like there's just room for one company here. There is eight million riders, right? Like today, ninety-nine percent of them are just using ICE vehicles. Not even a percentage is no like are using electric vehicles. So the market's huge. So I think there's multiple solutions at scale. That being said, I think for the target market we're going after. it really will come down to a performance to cost ratio right like there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of performance all of us can offer but at the end of the day there will be specific solutions that do better than others i think time will tell but uh, yeah there is a lot of differentiation in terms of what our battery chemistries are what our sizes are how we implement it what the tech stack is what the final product on ground is is quite different uh, the problem statement i'd say maybe the end solution is similar but uh, yeah the path is very different very for all different. three of us here yeah. like exponent your solutions are closed loop solution and so you know you've got log9 that's got an open solution open source solution and you and exponent are in a closed loop solution do you think that's an achilles heel or do you think that's actually a strength because you know there's the, the apple versus android argument which is you know which pegs to be put on the table why did you go, go for a closed loop uh, system right uh, interestingly for us uh, there is two parts to this too so from a usage perspective we are closed loop so there's only our batteries that can charge on the our charges today there is an intent to increase utilization for charges to the point where we are sure at least that the rider has the right experience because at the end of the day nothing matters more than making sure they ride 150 kilometers right like everything else is secondary so to fill that gap to be able to know that chargers are available their uptime is high that we have visibility all of that is very critical so building a closed loop network is a start but what is very different for us is the fact that the charger itself is standard we use a standard connector we use a standard charger there's nothing special on either side the tech is all shoved into the battery the charger is standard so tomorrow for us as a revenue stream as a whole market that's a whole different world but for us to then be able to guarantee the customer experience that we want it's very critical to have that in our control so that closed loop is a start for us but uh, there is nothing i'd say different or very unique about our charger it's a fast charger but any standard 3 kilowatt charger can charge our battery at the same rate the software algorithms and everything are all on the battery side right so tomorrow let's say if we start building with a larger oem or if we license to specific oems for a design part of it they can also charge using this as long as they're capable of charging those rates but uh, yeah experience and making that closed loop then make sure that we are actually in control and that's very critical how uh, open have oems been to uh, to your solution it's uh, surprisingly good actually like you you'd assume that oems all just want to keep everything in house just want to keep everything to themselves right but the realization for us also has been that there is a certain amount of cost 
they want to be hitting in a certain amount of performance. I feel like in terms of tech, we are a little bit ahead, maybe more than some OEMs. I wouldn't take names here, but there is a certain amount of performance, safety, let's say life that we're able to offer, but OEMs can't. And now it's just a matter of convincing OEMs to actually onboard our solution versus what they might be developing or what they think they need to be developing. So we've been testing consistently for a year and a half. There's a lot of process to what we've been doing. And there's a lot of, I'd say, uh, standardized automotive processes to how we've done design and development, testing, and then actual implementation, which then becomes appealing to OEMs. Right? I feel like the biggest issue for most startups trying to enter this space is that we off, we take a very minimal approach to kind of getting the job done. And for an automotive OEM to then be able to put your system on road, having been through decades of experience to get to where they are, it's very critical that you respect that level. And to be able to then know what stage we can go up to which OEM how to actually be able to actually mold our solution to different solutions. All of that we've been very specific on. It's a learning we've had from our past experiences also. And for us, the I, I wouldn't call it a ladder of OEMs, but there is like some OEMs who do smaller, some OEMs are very large. So for us to be able to kind of make sure we are on the right path there is very critical because this is one of those things, right? That there's a web of decisions here. Making those correctly is very critical. Otherwise, yeah, there's a lot of startups, there's a lot of companies doing I'd say similar things, but at the end of the day, all our products implemented on ground in a very specific way is what will matter. So yeah, there's a uh, traction that we're starting to have. Uh, there'll be a lot of announcement hopefully in the next couple of months in terms of OEMs we're tying up with, what kind of on ground solutions we are implementing. But yeah, there is uh, yeah, a few thousand units that we're kind of trying to onboard in the next few months. So let's talk about sodium then, um, which is, the, you know, it seems almost like the the next big thing and something that India is waiting for because you know lithium still has the geopolitics and you're still getting parts of your battery that are coming from blood diamond countries lithiums in countries where you've got a ship you've got all sorts of things right now China controls the lithium trade um, and sodium abund abundantly available uh, anywhere across India will be much cheaper you, we talked about the trade-off which is low energy density you know so you know you, it, it works in certain scenarios not in all it could work for energy storage could work for long distance slow deliveries you know slow speeds um, where are we at in this whole lithium journey and how excited are you about uh, sorry the whole sodium journey and how excited are you about uh, what sodium is going to do for your business the good thing about sodium is that in a lot of ways at least the architecture and the tech stack or maybe some people have built up is very similar so the transition at least for companies won't be that severe like some system who are already let's say adopted to an lfp chemistry it'll be even easier to go to sodium so there is a lot of work that we've already started to do from a bms front from a manufacturing front to make sure that link is made. There is a lot of learning, I think, uh, for just applications because the the charge discharge rates are a little different, the operating zones are a little different. But at least, uh, like you mentioned, the geopolitical part of it, the manufacturing for it, making sure we can industrialize and scale it in India, that actually will be a lot easier for sodium than it will be for lithium. And that again has its advantage. If it's that easy, then everybody will be doing it. If it has a disadvantage, so. The good thing is that there is still a lot of hope around sodium being that chemistry we onboard into our country where we kind of do from scratch, build out the entire, let's say the tech stack from scratch, not just be importing cells and assembling into whatever system we want to assemble it into. But I think there is an uphill climb there too, right? In just in terms of not just uh, amount of investment or capex required, but in terms of quality, getting the right chemistries, uh, making sure we have a lot of the the ground level, the Prussian salts, the graphites actually being figured out at a lab level, then we can scale to a million because cell plants, unfortunately, only make sense once they're in few gigawatt hours, like a few megawatt hours uh, just don't make sense. So five gigawatt hour, 20, all of those numbers are what we want to be seeing as a country, right? I think the good thing, though, is that including us, a lot of companies are trying. There's a lot of ground up work happening. But uh, yeah, the next couple of years will be very critical to see what the geopolitical scenario is with China. Uh, and how, yeah, sodium essentially as an industry scales in India from all the way from the chemistry part to actually setting up a gigafactories. But are you yeah. excited? Is this yeah, the panacea to the, to, no, the, it's, to the future it's, problems? Yeah, it's very, uh, it's very satisfying to see that we can actually be doing it all the way from the ground up, right? Like today, it's limiting for us also to know that, okay, we have a certain cell we start to work with. So there's only 120% improvement. So the percentage over a start point. If you control the start point, a lot of the claims that we make still hold, but it becomes a lot of lot easier to work with the 
the industry to push to the cost levels that we want, the performance levels we expect, the safety levels we are hoping for, all of them starts to make sense very quickly. And yeah, I think it's about time, but the big contender here is going to be China's LFP pricing. But uh, yeah, 60 to 80 dollars per kilowatt hour is what they are today, right? If, with all the overproduction happening. If that eases in the next couple of years, I think we have a good shot. But otherwise, yeah, LFP and just in general, like more modern NCA chemistry in the higher end will still remain. But yeah, LFP versus sodium will be an interesting one to see how that plays out. So finally, Shitanshi, let's talk about your funding journey uh, as a startup. Um, you've had your seed funding round about uh, 1.2 million, which was, uh, you know, largely participated by Transition Ventures, a fund that focuses on early stage companies in the energy transition space, such as yourselves. And uh, now, I guess you're ready for your your A series, or, uh, and which will be a larger sum. Uh, you know, maybe you can tell us what it is. And um, w- what's the journey now in your funding? Because you're going to go from 1 million to, you know, 10x almost in size. What are you going to do with that? And where's the next journey from that? And is this eventually going to be a listed entity in India? Or is it going to be part of some other big battery company? Where are you headed in your own dreams? Yeah, no, um, for us, uh, it's a capital intensive industry. So funding becomes a huge part of it. Uh, Transition and Gruhas participated in a seed last year. And that's got us to where we are today, where there's a certain market fit. We've been able to see some scale. There's a large order book now. And for us to now be able to scale this solution, not just let's say in Bangalore where we are right now, but across India, to be able to implement in different geographies with different partners is the next goal. So yeah, we're raising a 10 million round, which then gets us to this uh, point where essentially all of these factors in terms of going to market, scaling, the factory for it, setting up more chargers, all of that starts happening at scale. And yeah, there is a lot of interest in this space. I think it's one of those things that for India, especially uh, the fact that we import so much fuel, there's obviously all in the 10 most polluted cities in the world. There is a lot of work to be done. I think the good thing though, is that there is a lot of focus, at least in the commerce and the logistics space to start going electric. And then once uh, companies like us have that solution figured out, that scales very well across different uh, kind of systems, right? So two wheelers, tractors, we're very focused on off highway vehicles. So construction, machinery, mining, uh, we feel like there the TCO really makes sense for electric, right? Like if you can make sure an application where you're really exhausting your asset uh, kind of plays out, that is the best to go electric. So yeah, very focused on these applications, have a bunch of pilots that we're running. So those go to uh, market, hopefully within this year itself. And yeah, the big thing for us is to scale a battery tech company for India, right? Like we want to be from India for the rest of the world. I feel like for EVs, at least in the light mobility segment, the energy storage segment, India has a good shot to develop systems for the world, whether the cells come from China, whether we make it in-house is one part. But if you take the way the Japanese ice tech played out in the two-wheeler, three-wheeler world, India has a huge shot to replicate that for the rest of the world, for Africa, for LATAM, for all of Asia, all of that, and even parts of Europe where urban environments kind of thrive, right? So if you can make something cost efficient, rugged and high performing in India, that really scales really well all across the world. So the objective is that at some point, obviously we'll be listing, I I don't want to put a date on it, but the idea will be to get there and then actually scale the smaller systems and even the larger ones globally. You made a comment that we have the opportunity to be what Japan was to the ICE uh, vehicles in the 70s and the 80s. Um, You know, incredibly exciting, that statement. Uh, So I'm going to ask you a question. We ask all the talent that comes on our show. And I apologize for the frivolous nature of this question, but it always brings a very pointed answer from the people we asked it to. And the question is this. If you had the opportunity to be the Prime Minister of India for one day, and you could make any decision you wanted to help India become what Japan was to the ICE world, uh, this vision that you just described, what would that decision be? It's a good one. Uh, So there's obviously, I think, a lot of, I'd say, if, if you take manufacturing, the automotive, EV, or the energy space in general, right? There's a lot of work I think we need to do to also get the understanding right. Like there's make in India, but there's also design, there's engineer, research, all of that in India, right? Like there's a lot of work to just do from where you imagine an idea from a concept level and take that to production. I think that path is still a little bit niche in terms of how that's gone to market. So being able to come up with policies that actually promote not just something that you assemble or manufacture, but actually for ground up develop for this country, which then scales for the rest of the world is very critical. So 
a lot of policy a lot of uh, funding for this i'm not trying to steal from somewhere but the idea would be to basically promote ground up engineering right and ground up design ground up development because us taking solutions and for a lot of these segments it just creates a a system where we have to redo a lot of things and this has happened in a lot of the segments we're seeing in the ev world too right like there's already a lack of trust and confidence in a lot of these segments there's already this persona that okay this is a little bit of a gimmick it's not really ready to be able to push that ground up engineering and push brands out of india which are not just maybe it focused but also hardware focused i think is going to be big and the the best part is the talent is there the will is there the desire the intent all of the right things are in place i think the next decade for us to be able to really push a uh, quick engineering where they can compete with let's say the us and actually compete with globally for concept of production all the way from that will be very critical so yeah doing anything we can to promote that would be interesting uh, yeah i'm still not there to figure out exactly what but yeah a lot of revolves around policy funding yeah final question then and it's from left field Uh, you're a startup entrepreneur and you're from Bangalore. Um why is it that Bangalore is the startup capital of India and why is it not, it's not Pune, Bombay, it's not Madras, it's not Delhi, not Calcutta. Why what what is it about Bangalore that has the magic for startups? That's it's a great question actually. I'm from Mumbai, I grew up most of my life in Mumbai, right? And I uh, I think I only really visited Bangalore after college. It's not like I've spent too much time, but the last 5 years of my life have been in Bangalore. I think there is a certain Uh, you can call it energy vibe whatever it is right but there is a certain mindset which a lot of people i think there have to just want to do something right like a lot of people have had jobs have had good jobs bad jobs whatever that is but the i think in the last maybe 5 years there has been a giant change in people just realizing that yes this can happen that if i just put my mind to it anybody who wants to make something happen can make it happen and having a lot of similar people around you to make that kind of dream come true is very critical right and another part of it is just i think the influx of people coming from abroad and kind of uh, flowing back and forth to the bangalore i think that became the hub for a long year so the venture capital world grew quite well in bangalore i think so yeah it's just everything i think a lot of people money kind of sitting in bangalore a lot of people wanting to do things yeah all of that starts there but that being said there's a lot of good companies in the gurgaon region there's a few in pune there's few in mumbai there's a lot of happening everywhere so i think once bangalore starts to saturate which it is i think most people don't want to be moving there anymore i don't think anybody really uh, yeah so it has its issues but yeah i don't think i could imagine doing what i do anywhere else just the people we've been able to uh, hire the kind of the kind of office we run everything right it's it's pretty unique i started emo out of my 2bhk uh, for the longest time we ran it out of there and i couldn't imagine doing that in mumbai uh, so yeah so infosys came out of a 2bhk you yeah. came out of a 2bhk so it's the indian equivalent to the garage in silicon uh, valley yeah. the 2bhk she's on to tiagi we've had a lot of entrepreneurs on this show especially in the clean energy transition space and i have to say from all of the conversations we've had it is very clear that you are a smart man on a very smart mission trying to change the world and i'm sure you're going to get there and it's going to be very interesting to watch and over time celebrate your many successes thank you for making the time to come to the artima studio and Pune and we look forward to the next conversation we'll have together. No oh, please. Thank you so much Davin. It's uh, been following you for at least yeah, I don't even know how many months but yeah, it's great to be here. Excellent. Thanks so much. <laughs>